by way of introduction, uh, Julianne, Julianne Souza, who's standing closely to my right, is Stony Brook uh, faculty. She's the director of the biology online program. Joanne's biology online team is responsible for pedagogical development, implementation, assessment, and improvement of the online biology courses. And the interactive asynchronous component of large, in some cases very large, uh, live lecture courses. Uh, Joanne is a psychologist and a former communications specialist in health and education at at and and has been immersed in the online environment since 2003. Her co-presenter, Dr. Paul Bingham, who will be here in a moment, is a molecular and evolutionary biologist who has also collaborated with Joanne for over a decade to develop new pedagogical methods for more effective online teaching of undergraduates and graduate students. Paul and Joanne have also collaborated with USD alumni-owned tutors to develop the state-of-the-art online learning management system, which they currently use. This co collaboration, most importantly, has produced a very large body of long longitudinal data, over 6,000 students, allowing them to compare online versus live delivery of the same content. Thank you, Linda. I would like to call your attention to um, part of our title here, which is uh, the fact that this is a large class model. Uh, we teach uh, a good deal of students in our large classes, so I want to call your attention to the fact that this can be done well if it's organized properly. And the fact that um, this is the benefits of asynchronous online teaching. So we're looking at the fact that as far as a live class, a large class model, so the benefits are that we have this huge statistical profile of student confusion. And from the student side, we have the benefits of students being able to mentor each other and being able to benefit from all the students that are taking the class with them. Now, I'm the director of Biology Online, and currently, the Biology Online program during the summer teaches over 400 students online in both graduate uh, undergraduate classes that are both juniors and seniors, and we also teach freshmen and sophomores in very large online classes. Uh, we currently collaborate with Binghamton and with uh, New Pulse in trying to create a, an evolutionary minor that all of SUNY could take if they wished to, or other, other schools could also collaborate with us to give classes within that minor. We collaborate with TLT as far as uh, helping us with Blackboard and with the learning management systems, we're also trying to come up with a, um, a remote exam locator and uh, distrib distribution system that we're working within uh, SUNY to work with that. So we're, we've been kind of all over trying to push the online portion of the courses and the benefits of how these courses work. We also work with academic judiciary in trying to take the uh, academic integrity levels to keep them at a very high level within the online environment. Now, again, I came originally from um, AT&T, where I, I was a strategic problem solver. My job was to find the uh, gaps in communication and then to fill in those gaps with the technology. And I did this in the large business branch, and I worked mostly with education and health. Uh, I work with Paul Bingham from the Department of Biochemistry and Cell Biology, and you'll hear from him shortly. Um, I also work with T.N.U. Lang, who's our technical support person. But I want to call a, one more thing that's so important that I think we forget about. If we didn't have the support of the chair and the faculty and the um, staff within the life sciences, we could be nowhere near as effective as we are. Their collaboration and their openness to teaching students better is just amazing. And without the support of those people, we couldn't be anywhere near as effective as we currently are. So where we started, we started where Paul was actually teaching a large live lecture class, which was um, very popular to say the least. And we ended up filling the largest lecture hall on campus. Paul did his best to try to see if these students were understanding by trying to read the first few rows of the body language. But of course, you have the typical problems of a large lecture class. He couldn't really tell. And the students feel very anonymous in the, that environment. Very few of them will come to office hours, but they don't even think you know they exist. So then we get to the exam. 
and we get to the exam and we find out that the students don't know what they thought they knew, and the professor has no idea where the problem was. So what we try to do now is to fill up the gaps. Now, I liken this to riding a bicycle. And we're teaching the student how to ride a bicycle. We tell them all about the parts and the pedals and how to do it, and we tell them how they're going to interact with it, but then we don't hand them the bicycle until the exam. And then, of course, they fall. Our job was to give them the bicycle during the semester. We gave them the course content. Let them play with it. Let them make mistakes. Let them mentor each other, motivate each other, and let us be there to pick them up and help motivate them to learn so that by the time they get to the exam, they can ride the bike. And that's basically what we try to do in this large class model. So we look at the learning objectives, and then we use the technology tools to first find the gaps in the learning and then to fill the gaps in the learning. So I'll take you through some of the things we do. We break the class down into smaller asynchronous discussion groups, and our groups are rather large. Um, what we do is we have 50 students that we randomly place in these groups with one undergraduate mentor within the groups. Now, this undergraduate mentor is not supposed to give students answers. What they do is they push the critical thinking, they help students find where the bodies are buried. Where should you go and try to find out the information for yourself? Now, the benefit of this is the students get to have time to think, they get to research, they get to question themselves, they get to help build the answers themselves, and we completely stay out of this. Now, the student picks the question. We don't pick the question. They tell us where the confusion is. The other thing they can do is that they propose the answers to each other, so you have peer mentoring going on within these, these student groups. And there's also agreement. They can agree or disagree with anything we say as long as they go into the databases and they can find some type of support for how they're standing. But they're asked to constantly question each other, doubt, critical thinking. We don't assess students on content knowledge, are you getting it right or wrong? What we assess them on is their motivation and their critical thought and their effort into trying to pick up that material, turn it around, twist it around, let's see how I can look at this and how everyone else looks at it. Okay, we stay completely out of the discussions until the end. And then, this is what, uh, we, we can see though, the entire process. We can see exactly where the misunderstanding is because the students are writing it out. And we can see how, how large is this confusion? Where is it? Let me give you a little bit of how we break this down. So we're very clear in our objectives, first of all, as far as we give them rubrics, we give them examples of graded posts, so they know exactly what we're looking for in the discussion post first. Now, what you'll see here is I'm going to bring some of these things full screen. This is just an example of some of the things that students will do. I want to call your attention to the fact that the student is saying, or am I thinking about this completely wrong? He's questioning himself. Other students will come in, and then they try to help their, their colleague out. So if you'll, you'll see here, it says, an answer to you, Nadia. And a person will come in, and they'll try to help their colleague. This continuously happens. Now, you might say at some point, well, do you really read all these? I mean, how do you go through this many students? You've got, you know, 600,000, whatever. This is where the power of the undergraduate students come in. The undergraduate students will tell us where the confusion is. Each undergraduate student sends me uh, an email telling me, this is where the confusion is. And they pinpoint it to the thread and to where exactly where the confusion is. What do I have now? I have a beautiful statistical profile. I can sit across and say, okay, I have the same problem across five groups, across six groups, across two groups. I can then go in and I can look and I can say, okay, they're misunderstanding because they're coming in with prior knowledge that's incorrect. Or they're misunderstanding because they're connecting the dots in the wrong places. I then can feed this information up to Paul, who then will address it in a couple of different ways. It's a live lecture class, you can address it before we move on, if it's an online class, or both. What we do is, we have what we call a discussion clarification document. In this, Paul will come in and he will address all the areas of confusion. But I can tell him how much, where is the influence of the confusion, rather than him trying to guess, and we can pinpoint. The other thing we have is when the student comes to office hours, we can actually pull up their posts and we can go, okay, you got this, 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 this is where you went off. 
And it helps us for the students that wish to come to us now because we can focus in on what their individual problem was. So you can address the whole, but then you can also address the individual. So this is the type of answers. Now the next thing we do is we play off the e-quizzes, which again are asynchronous, it's outside of class time. So in the e-quiz, what we do now is we take the areas of confusion after we've clarified, and we start to ask them more difficult questions about the areas where they were confused. Not less difficult, more difficult. So that by the time they get to the exam, they've now not only clarified, we've retested and rose that, taken that area of confusion, and we've really helped them at a higher level so that they get a question on the exam in this area, they're very well prepared to answer any question that we would ask. So at this point, we have preliminary results of eight years of longitudinal data. Um, I can't put up the actual data, but we can show it to you during the, um, during the e poster sessions. But I can tell you that we have data from 2005 through 2012. We've had the live lecture class of 570 students um, each year. We have the fall and the summer online classes, which are greater than 150 each. Um, and then we have another, we have a combined class of 570 students from Stony Brook and another 60 from the University of Manchester online, that are completely online. So in other words, we have tremendous statistical power over this time frame. What I can tell you is what we see. If we look at exam scores over time and we do you know, assess the difficulty of the exams, the control is before the asynchronous assets of course started. And then of course we compare the online to the live to see are we as effective in the online as we are in the live. And I can tell you that what we do see, we've seen a continuous climb, continuous, up every single year because we have a ratchet effect where students are telling us what's wrong, we're reacting, the lectures are getting clearer and clearer and we just keep increasing. In fact, we've made the exams more difficult, and we're still not coming back down to where we started. We're doing very well with that. Now, the success, of course, depends very much on the faculty responsiveness. They have to be very open to having a partnership with people that can you know, help to do this. The clarity of the objectives of the students is crucial. And we have to focus the students on learning rather than memorizing, because they usually come into science classes just looking to memorize detail. So we have to convince them that's not a good idea. And of course, the setup of Blackboard, you know, and making students not have to play with the technology and make them frustrated before they even get to the content is really important. Now, we also started this in a, a sophomore and freshman class, which is a fundamentals of biology class. We use the same assets, but we use a little bit, we do it a, different, a little bit different because it needs to be more structured for the freshmen and the sophomores. What we do is we, we take exams, old exams, and we analyze them. And we find the most difficult areas that the students have in these exams. And we make them the center of the discussions. So we'll look at them, and the we'll, students will look at this, this question, which is just a multiple choice question. But I ask them to turn it into an essay. Tell me why the answer is correct. Which one's right, why? Tell me each one, why each one is wrong. Now go into the databases and tell me how is this science being used in the real world? Come back and tell me about research that uses this science. Makes them reach out, grab more information and apply it so that they remember rather than memorizing the detail. These are the types of responses we get. The students are citing, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And we can, again, connect the dots and see where their misunderstanding is. We use the same triage system, where the professor then will come in and he will clarify only the areas that have been identified as the most areas of confusion for the most students in the class. So it seems to even be working for the, for the freshmen and the sophomores because they become very engaged in actually doing this. They, they talk about different, you know, they're not sure as freshmen and sophomore what they want to do. So they start to go into the databases, into neurobiology, or into the doctor's journals, and they start to look to see how the science is applied. So it's, it's actually fun for us even to watch. So at this point, I'd like to turn over to Professor Paul Bingham, and he'll tell you a little more on, from the faculty point of view. Thank you. I just want to take the last two minutes. We have to sort of provide a brief faculty coda to Joanne's symphony there. 
Uh, so we, the course we teach together is a human evolution course where we're confronted with the challenge of, of getting people to understand how evolution works, is, which those of you who are biologists know is a lot harder than it sounds. And so we confront the problem of the whole fact that we have with content, that is understanding what students don't know, what they do know, and most importantly of all, what they think is true is that is not true and is getting in their way of understanding what you I have to, to tell them. As Joanne has already showed you, this asynchronous discussion groups are a very powerful way to produce active learning on the part of students that gets them to understand what they don't understand and attack that. What I'm here to tell you in the last couple of minutes is that this also provides an avalanche of feedback to faculty. And the normal either online or large live course format does not do that. We normally have an impoverished flow of, of feedback. If you have this feedback, you improve in dramatic ways. Things you think students understand, they don't. And things you think are difficult, they get. And so you're refocusing your efforts in ways that are vastly more effective. And you get better each year. As Joanne said, we now have very a large body of longitudinal data that the student performance just ticks up measurably every year. The effect sizes are large. The statistical significance is, is extremely powerful. Let me also emphasize from the point of view of faculty that you can do this without a new investment of time. In other words, this is the way you spend your lecture preparation time, taking this massive stream of feedback instead of sitting there with your notes, the same notes you've been using year over year over year. And so it's extraordinarily cost-effective from a faculty point of view as well. Needless to say, it makes your work much more satisfying as well. So Joanne and I will be here later. We can talk to you about the data, how, how strong the data are, the sort of inside baseball tricks that are necessary to make this work. Let me just end by emphasizing one last point. We've been focusing on the content and pedagogy development side here because that's what we have time to do and it's crucial. There's a third leg here, which is the technology development, which we haven't talked at all about. You've heard about it from several earlier speakers. That's also crucial. So technology is not transparent and user-friendly. It can be quite self-defeating. So we're working with Tian Liang here, who you'll meet today and who's here. We also work with two other people who aren't in the room today. Uh, Todd Rothman, who's a Stony Brook alum and a software developer that we've done a lot of work with in streamlining our course management system. And Dean Zimmerman, who many of you know on campus, who's an, who's an elite television video producer director who makes those of us who are perhaps less camera worthy than we should be, makes us look good. And that actually, that works really well from the point of view of engaging the students. You do a, a three camera shoot like a sitcom, right? It, you, you engage the students effectively even through the screen. So if you have those three legs, if you have a faculty commitment to the content, you have the other two professional pieces. Let me emphasize this. This is not people working for faculty. This is three co-equal branches collaborating and synergizing. Faculty, pedagogical specialists, technology specialists. If you have those three pieces, you can do some quite wonderful and effective things, both live and, and of course online. Thank you for your time. <laughs>